verses actually for the next couple of Sunday nights will be in these first two verses. W. Criswell, former pastor, actually the deceased former pastor, First Baptist Church of Dallas, Texas, said, if you can preach on a word, preach on a word. If you can preach on a sentence, preach on a sentence. If you can preach an entire passage, preach a passage. If you can get the whole book in, get the whole book in. If you can preach the whole Bible in one, in one uh, service, then go for it. Uh, I'm not preaching the whole Bible tonight, but we are going to look at a couple of verses, one verse in particular. Rosie the River is an icon. And of course, part of that icon is a World War II uh, poster that was uh, done about 80 years ago now, back in 1942. And it says, we can do it. An icon because uh, companies and industries shifted into wartime production while the men were being drafted or volunteering to go to, uh, to the military, uh, women came to work in the defense industries and began to uh, take an important job in production. So Rosie became the symbol of female defense workers, crucial to the war effort on the home front. Probably not as highlighted as, say, the 101st Airborne or the 82nd Airborne or some of the other, the Rangers or some of the other uh, military aspect, but the women who stepped up to the plate in World War II. And, of course, uh, Rosie continues to be a symbol of women in the workforce today. Norman, well, actually, J. Howard Miller was the, the author who did the first uh, painting, but it was Norman Rockwell who had a slightly different approach, who gave Rosie her name in the image uh, as she sits on her lunch break with a what appears to be a jackhammer in her hand. Uh, her lunch pail or her lunch box says Rosie. That's where the name came from. Rosie is the symbol of confidence. Well, Americans are a confident people. Confidence is part of our national DNA part of our culture. Even if we don't always act confident or feel confident, it's still there when push comes to shove. In fact, Americans can be overconfident at times. Or there are those occasions where we can possess low confidence and we just need a reminder of how God has blessed us as a nation. Confidence can be a double-edged sword. There's a fine line between confidence and arrogance and a fine line between being uh, confident but in a humble nature or confident in the terms of being prideful. Theodore Roosevelt said, when you're asked if you can do a job, tell them, certainly I can. Then get busy and find out how to do it. A lot of people would say that's poor advice and, and maybe so, but it also speaks of confidence. Christians are a confident people. Our confidence does not come from any self-will uh, or a can-do attitude or any inherent ability or resolve. Those things are good, by the way. If you have them, certainly can be used. But our confidence is like that of David of the Old Testament. It comes from something higher and from something deeper. And that is from a who, not a what. And it's also... Um, comes from how solid the object of our confidence is. David, who was a shepherd, then he became a soldier, and he became a sovereign, he had placed his confidence in Jehovah God. That was the source of his confidence in the good times and in the bad times, even when some of those bad times were self-inflicted. David was confident in the Lord, Chucky Baptist, you and I can be confident in the Lord in 2022. We can be confident in the Lord tonight. As we look at Scripture, Psalm 27, verse 1, I will be reading from the King James this time. Uh, the Psalms are the prayer songs of Israel, and so just the King James is a little bit more poetic. It begins, it says, a Psalm of David. The Lord that is in all caps in most translation, that is a uh, substitute word for Jehovah or Yahweh, the Lord is my light and my salvation. Who shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? May God bless the reading of his word. A Bible theologian, Dr. David Dockery, said, has said that... Uh, 
Psalm 27 is a psalm of trust. And true righteousness is about love for God and the joy of worship. And the one who loves God is secure in whatever tribulation, that's the small t, by the way, not the, the tribulation, that's in Bible prophecy and revelation, that's not what we're talking about, uh, in, in troubles and, and trials that come our way, because he or she is accepted in the arms of God. David was confident because God was his life. And tonight, you and I can be confident that God is that light for us because Jesus Christ is the light of the world. He is the light of your world and my world. And if we have any other light, it's just a pale imitation at best. We're talking about the real light that shines. As we look at the scripture, as we uh, look at a simple homily, then we see the Lord is my light. That is in verse 1. So I would have you note number 1. It is what is called a dawning light. <coughs> Uh, the word uh, in the Old Testament for light, it generally refers to daylight. Uh, the Psalms are very practical as well as very emotional at times. And so there's a lot of emphasis placed on being in the light versus being in the dark. And the scholars instruct us that in the Hebrew mindset, the day began with the rising of the sun. And of course, that can be used in a variety of ways, particularly as a metaphor of life over death. The believer... And that is you and I. We are assured of God's light in every moment, and particularly in the moments of our trials and troubles and tribulation. We're not alone in the dark. In Psalm 27, David is sharing about facing life-threatening adversity and life-threatening adversaries. And Jehovah God to him was like the morning, uh, the early rays of the, of the morning sun beginning to illumine the sky that has been dark for a long time. And now he's going to be able to see clearly and therefore to be confident because the Lord is his life. David's confidence when that word Yahweh or Jehovah is used, or Lord in the all caps and bold, depending on how your Bible has been printed, um, it is a reminder of that is the personal name of God. It's specifically the covenant name of God. David is a part of the covenant relationship, so he, yes, he could be confident. Well, as we think about that relating to us, because the Lord was as if he was the light of day in David's life. Well, you and I can be confident that Jesus Christ, who is God, he is the same God that David worshipped, is the light of day in our life tonight. In um, Yazoo County, and I may be around here too, I haven't seen any, at least not yet, uh, but I know in Yazoo County, kudzu is an invasive vine species. It was uh, introduced about 100 years ago uh, from Asia to help with soil erosion. I did not know that it's actually related to the, the pea or the bean family. I don't know if you'd ever want to harvest that and cook up a big pot, a big, uh, pot of uh, kudzu. don't know if I would go that, but you can make jelly out of the flower blossom of it. I know somebody who's actually eaten it. No, I haven't, but I know a friend of mine whose uncle has. Um, kudzu, of course, is known for it can overwhelm and overtake quickly. In fact, it grows about a foot a day. So I guess if you were to take a nap in, in a hammock in your yard uh, and you had cousin growing, be careful. It might actually overtake you and envelop you before the afternoon uh, was over. No, I'm probably exaggerating a little bit on that, but maybe not by much. Uh, it is a hardy thing. You can, you can hardly ever kill kudzu. Now, you can cut it way back and you can cut it way down, but it is hard because the roots go so deep and they can get pretty thick too. It prefers forest edges, abandoned fields, hillsides, disturbed areas where sunlight is abundant. And of course, being uh, prevalent in Yazoo County, I have seen some places where the entire hillside, they have a lot of bluffs, more so, uh, and deep bluffs, and I have seen them covered with kudzu. I always wondered what type of snakes live down in those crevices, probably as big as my thigh, probably, uh, and covered by the kudzu. It's not some place I just want to go, hey, let's go climb uh, a gray ball hill or someplace. They say it's the vine that ate the south, and sunlight, of course, helped in it. Say, so, well, now what does that have to do uh, with the Lord being the light? 
Because the light of the Lord is what helps us grow. And he, we are no invasive kind of species, I assure you. But we grow in the Lord by staying in his light and staying in his word and staying in prayer. And as a result, then yes, we can grow just like that vine every day in some capacity. And to be a growing church uh, in terms of spiritual maturity, to be a growing church in terms of uh, numeric uh, of people, in terms of seeing people come to faith in Jesus and to be baptized, and then in turn, they beginning to live and share their faith and helping others to get saved and be baptized because Jesus saves. So how do we apply that first point? The dawning light. Right now, we hear of disturbing news. Escalation of war in Ukraine, elevation of gas prices, expansive inflation. That's expansive. I didn't say expensive. But that's another category altogether. And what was sure, not necessarily as sure as it was, if it ever was. But that's life. Say la vie. But God in Christ is our dawning light who helps us to see things clearly. So, you know, we don't have to live and walk in fear or in a cast down, oh, woe is me, but rather we can walk by faith saying how great is our God and Jesus saves. Chucky Baptist, the first, like the first rays of the dawn that drives away and dispels the dark, so too the Lord dis can dispel any and all darkness that would envelop your life and my life even tonight. Let Christ be your dawn breaker for every heartbreak and every heartache or every headache that you have, have had, or may yet have. Where might his light enlighten you tonight and help you to grow? The Bible says, For you, O Lord, light my lamp. My God lights up my darkness, Psalm 18, 28. Then Jesus spoke to them again, saying, I am the light of the world. He who uh, walks... I actually did not finish writing that. I'm so bad. Um, I'm still learning how to type on, on my computer, and sometimes it, um, I'll hit the wrong button and delete. So I deleted that entire verse. Let me paraphrase. Basically, if we walk in the light of Jesus Christ, we're not going to stumble in the dark. That's what that passage says. In, um, in John, well, I'll cut that off too. So it's there. Uh, fact check me on that. I love it when I do this. It's awesome. I told you it'd be fun. We walk in His light, not every now and then. We don't walk in His light when it's convenient. We don't walk in His, in his light when it feels dark around us and we're scared, although that is also a good time. We walk in His light 24-7, whether it's in the good or the bad, whether it's in a bright day or, or pitch black, we walk in His light. Bishop Desmond too said, hope is being able to see that there is light despite all of the darkness. And that light is Jesus Christ. That light is Christ as we have that personal relationship with Him and as we, as we proclaim the gospel and as we live out the gospel. But there's also not just the dawning light, there's what I call the guiding light. David, as a soldier and sovereign, he understood the need for guidance. He was surrounded by men, some who were noble and knew what they were talking about. Uh, they were Many were politically astute, militarily sound, but there were some I get the right general. So it says General Joab, who was also related to David, who, while he was a good general, he was morally questionable. Read the life of David sometime and you will see what I'm talking about. So David had to depend on Jehovah God. You see, one of David's, um, one of David's spiritual advisors, well, there's Nathan, who's the prophet, but one of the spiritual advisors is a priest by the name of, if I get it right, Abiathar. Abiathar, of course, uh, had followed him and was helping him, but later on, after David had made some major mistakes of his own, Abiathar is not giving him the spiritual advice like you would think. Uh, Abiathar actually begins to uh, kind of look to other possible avenues of advancement, and they don't include David. Uh, Ahithophel is right up there uh, with that. So you want to make sure that, you know, when you turn to others to advice, that there are people that you can trust who will give you the news the way you need it. And so David had to depend on Jehovah God to guide his decisions and to guide his actions. And to the extent that David followed that, 
David was successful when David uh, tried to wing it or when David uh, just chose to ignore it, such as the census that he uh, was inspired to do, but for the wrong reasons, he failed miserably. Uh, David, and back when he was a soldier, before he became a sovereign, he and his men that had joined him, and they went on raiding parties. They, they lived in Philistine territory, but they'd go out and raid the enemies of Israel. They left no one living so that nobody could tell. It was dead men tell no tales. They'd come back to the headquarters where David and his men uh, and their families have been allowed to live. It's called Ziklag. Only this time when they come back, Ziklag is in flames. The smoke is billowing. And the, the women and the children and some of the older uh, people who were not able to go to the war or, or on the raids, they're gone. They have been captured and taken and the city set on fire by the Amalekites, arch enemies of the Israelites. And David and his men are upset. They weep bitterly. In fact, uh, they're so upset, they're talking about stoning and killing David. Even David's two wives, the culture of that time allowed for that. I didn't say the Bible says that that's the right thing to do. I'm just saying that's what the culture and that's what Scripture records. David had more than one wife. And his two wives at that time, they too are taken. So his family is gone. David is in great distress. It is his darkest day and it is his darkest hour. And the Bible says, But David strengthened himself in the Lord his God. Then David said to Abiathar the priest, Ahimelech's son, Please bring the ephod here to me. And Abiathar brought the ephod to David. So David inquired of the Lord, saying, Shall I overtake them? And he, that is God, answered him, Pursue, for you shall surely overtake them, and without fail recover all. 1 Samuel 30, verses 1 through 8. And sure enough, he follows God's directive and he recovers everybody. What became uh, was a time of mourning becomes a time of joy. Dr. Matthew Poole says, the Lord was David's light, his counselor in all of his difficulties. So how do you and I apply this tonight to us as, as God is our guiding light in Christ? Chunky Baptist, the Lord is a guiding light he continues to guide you and me. He does so through His Word and by the presence of the Holy Spirit. It's why it's so important that we stay in the Word every day. I didn't say you're having to read, not like I'm a class time. So, okay, uh, you need to read five chapters of Bible tonight, and I will quiz you tomorrow and read the footnotes because I, I test for the footnotes as well. I'm not suggesting that. I'm just saying stay in the Word. Uh, and be open uh, to what the Word of God. Go where the Word of God leads you. Not where you want it to go, but where the Word. Be like a CSI, that is crime scene investigator. Go where the evidence leads. Well, go where the Lord leads you. Go where the Scripture and the truth of God has made alive in your head and heart uh, where it leads you to go. As you do. Study Scripture uh, carefully and prayerfully. He never obscures his light to you or his light for you. His light always leads to him. It always leads to his way. How might you be needing his guiding light in your life tonight? Psalm 119, verse 105. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. His light guides through his light guides us, though the precipice is high. I've seen some pretty scary precipice before. Um, went to the World War II Museum in New Orleans a few years ago and thought, yeah, I'm going to get on the highest gangplank pantry gantry thing way up there. I mean, they have entire bombers hanging from the ceiling. It's absolutely amazing. I've got pictures on the phone. We'll see it sometime. Uh, absolutely amazing. I'm like, oh, I'm in the highest one. I'll be looking at it. Everybody's going to be like ants. Well, I got up there. I made it. No problem. And I got just out past the safety of the this part, and it's just the little gangplank that has the you know glass or plexiglass sides, and you realize how high up you are, and it stopped me cold in my tracks. I'd like to say, yeah, I conquered it and walked walked on. I'm glad that uh, that was not a moment where it was make or break because I guess I would have broke because I was, I'm not doing this. It just it stopped me cold. You say, well, what's that got to do with the price of eggs? I don't know. I just thought I'd share it for better now. Uh, but with that said, as we think about the precipice being high, and sometimes the way is narrow, it's the narrowest gantry I've ever been on, 
And yet, with Christ being our life, it doesn't matter how high or how deep or how narrow it may be, we can be confident, just like David was. My family and I recently watched a movie not long ago at the Cinemark Theater in Pearl. We sat high up. I like to sit in the nosebleed section a lot. Uh, that way you can see, look down and see everything. Uh, I have a friend of mine who wants to get as close as she possibly can, and I don't like that, but you know, sometimes you just take what seats are available. I, I love the fact that they have nice, comfy reclining chairs. <laughs> you can actually recline, and, and if the movie's boring, hey, you get a free nap out of it. But I have not yet fallen asleep in any movie um, and, you know, sitting in those chairs. And every, everything's great until the lights go down and it can get dark. Of course, being a three-hour movie, and it was a three-hour movie. There was no, <laughs> there was no intermission whatsoever. Non-stop, boom, boom, boom. Uh, naturally, eventually, somebody somewhere is going to have to get up, you know, go visit the concession stand, go visit the restroom, whatnot. And so I saw a lot of people taking their uh, mobile devices. I guess is what you call it, more than a phone. And they had that, I'm not going to turn it on because I might not get it off, but uh, turn their flashlight attachment on, and that's how they're seeing to get through the aisle. That's how they're seeing to get to the staircase uh, that has the, the, the lighted uh, strips that you are able to see to, so you're not going to break an ankle. And so that you don't sit down, unfortunately, on somebody thinking that's your seat and you're not paying attention. Um, there was one or two people I thought, okay, I'm, I'm here, please don't sit on me, uh, go somewhere else. But they had the light so that they could see. You and I have the, the blessing of having the light of Jesus Christ so that we're able to see and we don't have to stumble around in the dark, spiritually or otherwise. So it is a guarding light. Some lights exist to provide security, especially in the nighttime or in the dark places. A nightlight can afford a sense of comfort as well as uh, confidence. Uh, I have a clock in our bedroom. It has the old green numbers and it's, it can be bright. I actually use that for a nightlight for when I need to get up in the night and I can see to come back. It's not so bright that it would keep anybody awake, but it's not so dull that it doesn't do any good. And so it's nice sometimes if I wake up um, during the night at different times and I don't just glance to see what the time is. It's just nice to have a little bit of light in the room sense of uh, security and confidence, I suppose. David would find uh, comfort and confidence with the Lord. The Bible says in Psalm 27, verses 4 through 6, One thing I have desired of the Lord, that I will seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, and to behold the beauty of the Lord, and to inquire in His temple. For in the time of trouble He shall hide me in His pavilion. In the secret place of His tabernacle He shall hide me. He shall set me high upon a rock. And now my head shall be lifted up above my enemies all around me. Therefore, I will offer sacrifices of joy in his tabernacle. I will sing, yes, I will sing praises to the Lord. He was confident because the Lord was his light in the day and in the night. The Bible says in John chapter 1, verses 5 and 6, In him was life, and the life was the light of men, and the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend, some translations say, did not apprehend it. I kind of like the apprehend, even though uh, the darkness did not understand, and that what they couldn't understand, they could not destroy or defeat. Christ shines in the darkness. In the Old Testament, God led Israel out of Egypt, and he did so graphically in a way to instill confidence. Now, I'm not sure exactly what that might have looked like, but he led them by way of the column or pillar. When I first taught that, I had students, he had a pillow? No, that's not what I said. Uh, it's a pillar, P-I-L-L-A-R, and since I can't always pronounce it right, I'll go with the word column. So we can kind of picture a tornado phone. There you go. Um, I actually showed an image of that, and I think it stuck with it. But with that said, um, the, the column of cloud by day and the column of fire by night, that's very graphic. And he did that to give them confidence to follow as they're leaving slavery behind. The Bible says, And the Lord went before them by day in a pillar of cloud or a column of cloud to lead the way, and by night in a column of fire to give them light, so as to go by day and night. He did not take away the column of cloud by day or the column of fire by night from before the people. 
And also during that event, as the Egyptian army begins to encroach, and they've got the army behind them, and they've got the Red Sea or the Red Sea in front of them, you know, the proverbial rock in the hard place, and we are going to die. I mean, that's probably what they're thinking. And of course, Moses is praying, and God does a miracle that will part that Red Sea. But one of the things we don't always catch, and um, some of the movies, uh, some of the late, earlier movies have shown it, not so much some of the later movies, is that God began to strike the Egyptian army, the soldiers and the horses with confusion. Wheels uh, came off, uh, horses would get uh, uh, scared. But one of the things was that that column of cloud and fire came between the Israelites. And for the Israelites, it provided light as they crossed during the nighttime. It also provided darkness for the army of the Egyptians who were trying to pursue I suspect that that was an awe-inspiring sight, but it gained confidence. Tonight, you and I need no pillar or column of cloud by day or by night to be able to walk in the light and live confidently. He who is the essence of that column would say to us, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age or the end of the world, as we read in Matthew chapter 28, verse 20. How confident have you been lately? How confident are you now? How confident might you become, especially knowing that Christ is your not only guiding light, but also your guarding light as well? Dr. Stephen J. Lawson says, David expressed great confidence in God because the Lord was his light, a metaphor of divine holiness, truth, life, all that is positive and good, and all that dispels the darkness, does His grace enlighten you? And does it enrich you tonight? I pray that it does. We never need stumble when He is our light. As we, as we close, I want to share with you what a friend of mine from New Orleans Baptist Seminary uh, posted uh, a few, several days ago now. Her name is Becky. And uh, it's a post from Dr. Ken Taylor. He is the current pastor of Gentilly Baptist Church, and he is my successor, one of my successors anyway, in New Orleans. It says uh, here that um, it talks about being confident uh, amid any and all darkness, and we can be courageous uh, because, and, and even moving forward and conquering because Jesus is the light, and he's the light shining in the darkness that cannot um, be apprehended uh, by the enemy. So here's what Dr. Taylor said, and I share it with you. 17, I shared it Wednesday night too. 17 Ukrainian Baptist ref refugees had planned to meet recently to form the first Ukrainian Baptist church in Poland. As it turned out, the inaugural, that is the very beginning meeting of this church, had 60 adults and 20 children present. May the Lord multiply this kind of church plant and use Ukrainian and Polish believers to share the love of Christ, end quote. And of course, Becky then went on to suppose, look what the Lord has done in the midst of all the devastation. Confidence in a time where Ukrainians might not have the confidence uh, they, you and I might think of, and yet they're planting a church. And who's to say how God is going to use that in some amazing ways? His is the light that shines in the darkness. And Chunky Baptist, you and I are part of that light that shines in the darkness. If we have Christ in our heart, then we reflect the light. We are the light shining in the darkness. And the darkness here in Chunky in Newton County will not apprehend it and destroy it. Tonight, you can become confident. Ask Jesus to be the light in your darkness. If you do that, trusting Him to save you, maybe for the very first time, then come to the front and make that decision public as well as personal. Tonight, maybe the Lord is calling you to, to follow Him and His light, and that light will lead you here to unite with this church. Then let this church become the place where you can belong and build your confidence in the Lord. You too come and make it public and personal. And perhaps you suffer from low confidence or you've been burned by overconfidence. The Lord is perhaps calling you just to come and pray, to look to Him who is your light and who is your life? You come as God leads you, as our worship leaders come tonight uh, to play. And as we stand and sing our invitation tonight, you come just as you are. 
come and walk in the light of the Lord Jesus Christ as he would call you to walk in this light. Let us stand as we sing our hymn of invitation. Come, be confident. Number 319.